So with that, uh, let's start moving and talk about how generative AI is changing the digital marketing world. Uh, the team at NetElixir have been long-term friends, partners of the BWG community. So I'm gonna kick it off to you, Udayan, if you can introduce yourself and we will dive into the information and do some polls along the way. That would be lovely. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. That. Thank you very much, Tiffany, for hosting us. And uh, thank you all those who have been sort of joining, uh, joining this webinar. Uh, as many of you who have joined the previous webinars, I think uh, this has been one of the topics very close to my heart personally. And at Netflix, we take a lot of pride in being an AI first digital agency. So it's something that everyone is sort of literally living and breathing uh, AI. Uh, so I had just a quick table of content about Netflix a little bit for those of you who may not really know as to who we are. Uh, a little bit about generative AI and search and I added a specific segment, which is on the great e-commerce disruption. Now I must really sort of start with a bit of a cautionary <laughs> remark essentially in this thing, Tiffany. Uh, it's uh, purely my point of view. It's entirely my personal point of view based on some of the stats and so on. And also we work with about 170 customers, all of them retail or direct to consumer e-commerce companies. It's based on firsthand experience working with uh, all of our customers. Uh, as such, many of who actually have joined this presentation. And then I have, I'll try to share as to how exactly you can really uh, address and try to really combat all of these changes which is going on, which we call the future of performance marketing. We have a lot to cover. Uh, as always, this probably would be extremely intense and data packed. Feel free to stop me, pause me, and just ask any questions that you may have. Uh, about Netflix, sir, we recently had our 20th birthday, Stephanie. So uh, hey, it really, yes. it's, it feels amazing because, uh, I mean, when we had started, there was another company, I, you may have heard of it, which started in the same year. Uh, it has become the world's largest social media network these days. But anyway, that's a different story. So we both started in the same year, essentially. Uh, the Apple iPhone was still in 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 Steve's mind, I think Steve Jobs' <laughs> mind. It had not really, so there, there has been a lot which has happened in the last 20 wow. years, and we really have been very fortunate and very lucky to be at the right place at the right time. So that's, I think, what our story has been. Uh, we have built, I mean, we set up a product innovation lab uh, back in our office in India, in Hyderabad, in 2017, and have been working on building our own machine learning algorithms to solve one specific problem, Tiffany, for digital marketing. We really wanted to precisely predict and target the higher value customers who have a higher lifetime value, and we use machine learning to do that. And that's what Alexa Insights is about. We were very fortunate that about two years back, we were selected in this uh, rather elite Google agency leadership survey, which is which comprises the top 27 of the Google uh, advertising agencies in the US. And we are also a certified minority business enterprise as well. And uh, something really close to my heart, we also have our own nonprofit uh, called the Udan Foundation. We support young girls from slums in India and support their education, the high school and the college education and help them find a job. And I have a bit of a absolute latest of the press scoop for everyone. I mean, we had our third batch now graduate of Udan. We have 24 girls that we are supporting currently. And she just got a job in Accenture. And this happened yesterday. So oh, it's like wow. as fresh as it gets. So these girls coming from the slums where they were getting married off at the age of 13 and 14, now to suddenly really sort of providing for their family, it's just a very emotional and a very special experience that we have been able to, in a very small way, contribute to their to their enormous success and drive and so on. So if any one of you is interested in knowing more, feel free to scan this QR code and uh, you will read a lot of our stories and interesting uh, uh, anecdotes. Sir. A little bit about me. Uh, I founded Netflix there along with my wife literally out of our living room back in India, in Hyderabad in 2004. And we literally have been living the dream every day. Very fortunate to work with amazing team members. We have about 35 team members in the US and about 90 team members in India. So it's a fairly small team still, about 125. We call ourselves NetElixarians. Very, very proud about it. Uh, I am also uh, uh, very involved in the academic world. I am an innovation fellow in Columbia Business School and uh, do fairly regular lectures at the Johnson School of Management in Cornell, Indian School of Business, CUNY, and so on. And feel free to connect with me. I am very accessible and approachable, I can assure you that. So that's, I think, what my background is. A little bit about generative AI and certain. A lot really has happened in the space 
in the last about 15 months to be precise, I mean, 15, 16 months to be precise. Uh, I'm pretty sure this may resonate with you from Marco, uh, marketunist, right? Can't we just use artificial intelligence to manage our sales funnel for us? And <laughs> the answer was, I found four places that sell funnel cakes fairly close to us. So from here to have chat GPT, literally within 1 million users in five days and 100 million in two months, yes, AI has really progressed a lot. And uh, it is really, I think unleashing is the word. I mean, effectively, uh, we are all getting impacted by this enormous generative AI boom that is impacting all of our lives, all of the professional lives, personal life, everywhere and so on. And if that was not really a success thing, I mean, this is an interesting graph. This shows the number of earning call mentions of this generative AI, Tiffany. So how many times the CFOs or the whatever, the, the, the chairman or the CEO mentioned generative AI and this tracks between Q1 2021 to Q3 2023. And as you can see, the number suddenly spiked. So it's very much like most technologies, right? If you really look at, even when the Netscape browser was launched, very few people used it and suddenly it spiked. When this small search engine that no one had heard about called Google had launched, it was very few people were using it and then suddenly it spiked. So we are seeing very clearly time and again, it always happens this way, gradually and then suddenly. And what our mission has become at Netflix, we really wanted to stay ahead of the curve and we really wanted to help our customers stay ahead of the curve as well. Because we are realizing the power of generative AI in our day-to-day -day lives, in our work lives, whatever we do at Netflix or on a daily basis. For example, we have built a platform called Alexar GPT to run our internal operations or all the internal workflows. That has been a security layer built on top of ChatGPT. We started working on it a year back and now it is in a pretty good shape. The advantage is for many of the tasks that were earlier consuming many hours, we have really been able to slash the time. And this time is being invested in a lot more productive, a lot more thinking work, which really moves the company forward as such. So I can vouch firsthand that we have benefited enormously through the active use of ChatGPT uh, or LXR GPT, which is a much more secure option that we have really built uh, on a, 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 our team essentially has created or built. So. I hope after at the end of this presentation, I'm able to at least convince some of you that if you have still not really jumped onto the, the generative AI bandwagon, hopefully after this presentation, all of you are able to at least open up one of the tools, whether it is Claude 2, whether it is Gemini, where, well, I mean, Gemini, despite the recent controversies, I think is a still very powerful platform. And uh, obviously the chat GPT and uh, perplexity has become an answer engine, which is very, very popular and so on. Because you would remember, I mean, in the space, this is Alta Vista in 1998, right? And uh, then it became Yahoo. And then there was Google, right? So if you really look at the entire phase of evolution, which we, I, I think uh, that the famous economist, Joseph Schumpeter called it the creative destruction happened. I mean, Alta Vista is no longer there. Yahoo is no longer there. Google is there. So the fundamental question which Bill Gates asks or says, uh, uh, will the top AI agents really replace the search and shopping sites? Because maybe fundamentally it will change the human behavior of searching forever. Maybe we'll never have to search. We really have to discover. We probably have to ask. We will really have to maybe explore and find out things and so on. But it's definitely a distinct possibility as such. And I don't really want to show it, uh, specifically being in Google agency leadership circle, I don't have any intention to showing it. But I think it's important for you to see as to where the world has moved to. And we are seeing already it has advanced quite a bit in the last 15 months. Like we have seen the emergence of a new conversational search funnel. Some of you may have played with what Google calls the search generative experience. Others may have really used the new Bing with the separate chat, separate section altogether tab. So very clearly all of this is changing at a warp pace. Now just think of it. Just two or three questions. The first question I would ask you, I'm pretty sure, if not all of you, at least most of you, hopefully are advertising on Google Ads, right? Search advertising. Tell me what happens when search advertising, the entire search page, which is getting all this traffic, the informational traffic, 
the transactional traffic and the navigational traffic, suddenly the informational traffic goes off and just uses the bots, whatever it is, the, the chat bots, whichever is there, right? So what happens to that top of the funnel, right? The second question, which I would sort of pose for you is, if we are getting all the answers by just asking things like comparison shopping and so on and so forth, do we even really need to spend time daily finding out and checking out the different links on Google? Why so? Because the intelligent chatbot is already able to see all of those different ads out there and give me a summary of this. The third question, which I think is all the channels, whether it is Google, Microsoft, everyone is struggling with, how do we monetize in that case, right? I mean, what is the monetization opportunity there? For you, the advertiser, I think the big question is, Google probably drives still about 60, 65% of your site's traffic and revenues for the direct side, the direct to consumer side. I mean, if that suddenly starts getting impacted, how do you really recover all of these lost traffic from and specifically knowing some of the challenges which, for example, TikTok is experiencing today, literally, and mm -hmm. sort of moving forward, right? So it's a, it, it really has led into a huge amount of turmoil within the digital marketing space and the channel marketing space as such. And this is, I think, uh, an article which came out uh, in Wall Street Journal about two weeks back. And uh, I think fundamentally, we'll only get to know maybe in a couple of years or maybe five years from now, I think this will go down as one of the most important articles to uh, probably ever be published uh, in the technology space. It, it says it's the end of the web as we know it. So that's where I think the, the entire concept is. It's the time for all of us to reimagine what the new web would look like, what the new digital marketing channels would look like, what the future of e-commerce would look like, and how will really people engage with the different properties, whether it is your website, whether it is the marketplaces, whether it is a chatbot, whether it is a social media site and everything. And to compound all of this stuff, Tiffany, what's also happening is we are seeing this deprecation of third-party cookies on Chrome. I am pretty sure all of you are aware of it by now. I did probably about 10 presentations for the VWG group since 2021. And we had been anticipating that this is coming, 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 and Google has been pushing it constantly. It literally, I think, was always in the coming mode since April 2021 when the iOS 14.5 really hit uh, and things changed quite a bit. So what we are seeing uh, at Netflix, the future seems to be, instead of a one open room, it seems to be built of walled gardens. Each walled garden effectively uh, is run by one of the metas or one of the Googles or any one of the properties, right? And they are fanatically possessive about ensuring that they really retain all the customers within their vault gardens. They're able to track, measure everything within the vault gardens. And most importantly, they are able to really create this full funnel within the vault garden so that the monetization cycle or the flywheel that they have been able to build continues. The question which, or I, I would say rather than the question, a big thought that I'll sort of plant in all of your heads, what is preventing you from building your own vault garden? If Google can build the walled garden because it's the same ecosystem you are playing in, why can't you really build your walled garden? Because you have access to all of your first party data. And I'm pretty sure that first party data is extremely valuable. Why can't you really you build the walled garden where you are able to responsibly engage with your advertisers? So that, I'm sorry, with your online shoppers and so on. So that's the thought which I would put. I mean, what Google and uh, Meta and every company is doing, they're essentially relying on AI. We have seen the emergence of module, I'm pretty sure I'll probably hear almost like a few grunts uh, going on where I talk about 70% of the ad budget of Google is now going through Performance Max or a, a big chunk of meta budget is going through Advantage Plus. And there is almost like no control or very minimal control, let me sort of correct myself, when it comes to, let us say, some, a module like Performance Max and so on, right? Because, and all this is also leading to a big competitive saturation a significant spike in the overall cost, the advertising cost, the control is lacking, visibility is missing. And understandably, you can no longer attribute the concept of the last click attribution. Uh, I think it's high time that we finally put it to rest because honestly speaking, if you really focus only on the last click attribution monitoring, uh, it may not be of much value in your being able to run a successful advertising campaign and scaling a successful advertising campaign. 
uh, at this point in time. So that's where I think the thing is, but let me pause here, Tiffany, any questions at all so far? So that was the first part on the search part before I move on to the direct to consumer and the e-commerce, some of the yeah. stuff that we want to bring in. Yeah. And reminder, questions, comments, put into the chat in the Q and A as we move yeah. along. Um, so the whole idea, the reshaping of traditional search and then as a brand, you know, thinking of, you know, what are those key insights or things you need to start thinking about or you need to understand as this shift happens? That's a great question, Tiffany. I think the first point I would request all of you to do is uh, really have a plan or a strategy to effectively manage. First of all, compile or sort of aggregate all of your first party data and really manage first party data. How exactly will you really, because in many large organizations, the, the data may be sort of hidden in remote corners. I think it's important to bring all of this together because this is your biggest asset in the company. I mean, despite your size, whatever you may be in terms of your online revenue, et cetera, your data, your first party data is your biggest asset. That's the first point that I would sort of urge everyone to really follow. The second part is at this point in time, I think, uh, I mean, it's fair for me to even mention that if you really want to do let us say Google advertising or meta advertising and continue to do that, uh, you really have to find out a way to make, let us say the, the platforms work, the, the performance max modules work and the advantage pluses work. And soon I am pretty sure Amazon would really automate and make the entire internal advertising management AI driven because I think Amazon, if you really look at how their advertising has evolved has been significantly inspired, let us say, by Google and Meta's advert, the advertising evolution. I think the, the concept is the same. They'll also really do an AI to take off the controls from you. Because you really have to figure out a way of making those so-called the black box modules really work of Pmax and the Advantage Pluses. The third component is, I think, which I'll sort of make a make a make a big case uh, uh, a later point in time as well. I think uh, you really have to consider all of this in a context that Earlier, you probably could rely significantly on just one channel. Uh, it is my firm belief that the concept of one channel uh, success probably are behind us now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think uh, it is any longer possible to, uh, in a very reliable manner, really build an organization or an e-commerce business just focused on, let us say, Google advertising or just focus on matter image advertising and so on and so forth. I think those days are behind us. So that's, I think those are the three things. So be mindful of your data. The second thing is you have to really figure out a way of making these uh, AI powered modules within the giant channels work. Uh, and the third component is uh, you really have to accept that channel fragmentation is very much the order of the day. You really have to just ask a simple question as to how do you really optimize your media spend across the different channels so as to be able to uh, meet your objectives or exceed your objectives or goals and so on. Mm -hmm. Super interesting questions, comments, uh, put in the chat. You know, it's scary and overwhelming, but also very exciting. You know, it's new opportunities. Uncharted yeah, territory. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, got a question here. Uh, since Gen AI is a learning algorithm, and if AI will be replacing search, does that behoove brands to start building articles and favored data that AI can find in order to recommend a brand more frequently as a solution? Because AI, ha AI has more info on that brand product than maybe your competitor. Yeah, I think that's a great point, uh, John, because I actually had sort of mentioned in my ETL panel last year in uh, 2023, I think, uh, ETL Palm Springs. And I said that it, I don't think it hurts to strengthen your brand, right? And strengthen your brand by really having to really build out those associations with your brand. Because at the end of it, some, open AI probably is sort of taking all of the information from widely accessible net, right? And it's sort of refreshing on a very regular basis. So absolutely, yes. Uh, the question, though, is at some point in time, they really have to bring in that additional level of filtering, uh, which really helps them sort out. Because just think of the situation, because let us say your brand, as well as 20 of your competitors of the same quantum of data and the right associations, uh, effectively does it in certain case, uh, almost like uh, if, if in a certain situation, can it really provide the actual real authentic information. So I think the authenticity is the other part, which I think is a key component as well, which I really wanted to emphasize 
uh, also. But you're right. I think I don't think it hurts uh, if you really go ahead and just sort of start building content around the brand and constantly on a regular basis. It shouldn't understandably be only content. It's just the creative and the content strategy has to be very robust around that. But great Does question. It yeah. Makes sense to move budget then from like that cost per click model to PR or post. Well, I don't think it's a question of either or at this time, Tiffany, primarily because, uh, I mean, at this point in time, I really wish anyone really had the answer for this question. But at this point in time, my uh, answer to this will just experiment, right? Because you don't know. I mean, these are transition times. It's almost like I, I, I really uh, try to draw an analogy with this tectonic shifts, right? Because all of these, uh, the plates were moving around and mm -hmm. at some point in time, the plates have to come together and suddenly the continents emerge, right? Mm -hmm. So we are at that phase, the plates are moving around. And I'm just guessing the plates will probably continue to move around for the next couple of years, right? Or year, year and a half. That is the end of 2025 or beginning of 2026. So during this time, I think the the, the it, it's important to really build almost like a culture of experimentation, to really go on to keep out testing different things. So it's... Uh, one of the things that I would definitely not advise for is really just bank on one thing and then find out that, oh gosh, it was not really the right thing for us to do at some point in time. So I think it has to be multiple parallel projects that you really need to run. And uh, all of them should really lead to providing you some insights, which really helps you get a little more informed effectively. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, what I would I would recommend. But great question again. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let me move on, uh, Tiffany, uh, on this one. Uh, the second part, I must say, is uh, I'm pretty sure for all of the the, the retail and DTC companies would be uh, interesting. Uh, I'll present again purely. I already warned Tiffany on this thing. <laughs> I'll present what I consider to be my personal views, but based on some of the things that are going on, as I mentioned, uh, effectively, is we work with about 170 plus companies uh, in the retail e-commerce and the direct-to-consumer space the uh, and so on and uh, there is a lot of disruption out there i wanted to really call to your attention that's i think the entire goal of this section uh the, the one theme and we'll probably do a separate session tiffany on this in one of the later bwg sessions there are about five mega forces which is changing the face of e-commerce or online retail and i really wanted to touch upon only one of them for this one and as i mentioned in our next bwg webinar, which probably would be in the next couple of months, I'll sort of highlight these top five forces, but I really wanted to focus on this middle market squeeze. So this is typically uh, the, the overall market composition uh, for fashion apparel uh, uh, segment, right? So you really have the value market at the very bottom. You have the mass market or the fast fashion. Uh, you have middle market, which is normally, I think, a bigger chunk than what it showed in this, uh, uh, in this triangle picture. And then you have the high-end fashion and then you have the hot couture. So that's right there at the top. Uh, I wanted to very specifically touch upon as to how Sheen and Timu are effectively leading to, oh, I'm sorry, the shrinking of this middle market and expansion of the mass market, right? So they are essentially really causing the middle market to essentially get squeezed effectively from the back and almost like lifted all to the way to the, almost like to the high-end fashion as such. Now, if you really look at it, middle market by our estimates, typically about 35 to 40% of all the fashion apparel retailers, or let us say home goods and so on, they happen to comprise the middle market numerically, right? It's about 40%. Now, just consider what happens if because of the impact of Timu and Sheen, this 40% suddenly sort of shrinks to about 38%. We're talking about massive numbers out there. And that's what is really going on. And I wanted to share with you a few uh, uh, a few overall insights, which I think will hopefully help me define this case. So this is from uh, Ernest's uh, uh, transaction data set. They are a research group, where as you can see that this is Timu's monthly indexed sales growth. So as you can see, this is like, it has been like literally gangbusters is almost like an understatement in this situation. <laughs> And believe it or not, Tiffany, they all, Timu already has about 1% of the entire online retail or the e-commerce market. They already have 1% market share. Can you even imagine 1% market share where this, this company was not really even existent 
<laughs> literally till about Super Bowl of 2023, right? It's about a year. So this has been the fastest ever growth by any company. And what it is doing is, it is really, and I sort of make some points and some instances there. It is tried essentially squeezing the middle market and sort of getting in the, get, getting in the mass market a lot more popularized and a lot of disposable income sort of a thing and so on and so forth. There is, there is a lot sort of going on there as well. So I know I had a question uh, at this point in time, probably this thing, but before I get into the question that I have all of you, and we have, we are giving out some Starbucks cards. So whoever is the first one to answer this question on the chat, the next question that I'm going to ask, uh, feel free to sort of add it on chat and we'll sort of send you uh, a, a Starbucks gift card. Uh, thank you. you. Uh, this is Timu's customer retention versus other online mass retailers. Again, taken from the same earnest report. Uh, pay careful attention to this because yeah. what this shows effectively is Timu's retention percentage is 28.2%. The yellow line on top, of course, is Amazon. But look at as to what is the retention percentage online of Walmart, which is 26.4, right? So Timu already beats all of the re other retailers in terms of customer retention. Incredible. Can you believe it? Incredible. I mean, like this is 14 months or 13 months, 14 months in the US and they are beating, and this is like at scale. They are, by, by no means is their scale small because they have 1% of the overall online retail market share, right? Now this concept is called the retention smile. So if you really look at the green curve, it almost like looks like a smile, right? So it just curves down and then sort of curves up, which proves that once the Timu customer is again coming back after a certain period of time, right? They're not really going. And this, this curve, the 28.2, with the way it, the slope is going, I think it's very likely that 28.2 will soon become 30% and 30% will become 35% and so on and so forth. So which shows very clearly a clear loyalty being built with Timu as they really continue with their massive amount of advertising splurge. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about the advertising splurge. I really wanted to point out because this may be actually impacting your business. I'll actually share with you a very specific case as to why it is really driving the Google and the Facebook advertising costs dramatically up. But before that, let me ask you a simple question. And the question that I have is, can any one of you spell out which income segment accounts for the largest share of sales for Timu? Any guesses, please? All right. We have the poll live. Yeah, we have the poll. Yep. Yeah. No. Coming in hot. Get another 20, 30 seconds here. Uh, all right, I think. So I ended the poll. Do you, how do you want to do the Starbucks card? Yeah, I think anyone who's in the right segment. So can we really see? I mean, this is the right answer is this, Stephen. 130k to 190k. What does the poll show? What? So 16%. Okay. Said 130 to 190. So 40% assumed under 55 and under. That is, I think, what it is, right? So essentially, anyone who sort of gave the right answer and everyone, because I'm pretty sure BWG would know as to who was in that 16%, we will be sending out a, a congratulations Starbucks yes. card for you because right. you would need a lot of coffee to really go through some of these times. <laughs> Pretty intense time, which sort of companies like Timo and Sheen are driving. Isn't that surprising? Wow. Isn't that absolutely ridiculously surprising, right? That 130K is... to 190, that, that's really a fairly affluent family, essentially. Now, from that perspective, this is the household income, Jill. Yep, this is the household income. And that's what sort of makes it very surprising because that is one segment which was considered to be target segment, Right. That is one segment which everyone has been trying to target. And that is one segment which is really driving their loyalty as well. That is one segment which has been willing to spend more amount of money to really buy your product. That mm. is one segment, and I sort of make a very strong case out here, and pardon my passion on this thing and probably intensity on this as well. There is one segment whose 
consumer behaviors are con getting changed forever. And that is something that everyone should be concerned about. And that was the point that I really sort of just did this section. Because we are fundamentally altering the consumer behavior of a highly valued household income segment, right? Just think of the implications and the expectations that these, these folks would have from other brands as such, right? So that is the reason when I say tectonic shift, Stephen, I'm talking about that because once habits get formed, it has been proven. It's really very difficult to really get them back, right? So no wonder that the mass market is really taking over and the middle market is getting squeezed. It is not really impacting probably absolutely the top segment in fashion. But I would say very clearly based on this, the next 24 months for some segments like the home goods, fashion, footwear, et cetera, et cetera, any segment that you are competing with Timu will really face a tremendous amount of margin squeeze. A tremendous amount of margin squeeze. Can you so, confirm, is that household income or individual income? This is the household income, Tiffany. Household. This is the household income, but yeah. But this is like, as I mentioned, target segment, right? So overall, target effectively goes after this segment. Walmart no, normally goes after the B and C, or let us say A, B, and C, but this is the target segment. And as you can see, I mean, overall, I think that's something which I really wanted to call out because this has far-reaching implications that we'll only sort of get to know maybe three months, six months, mm -hmm. one year down the line. You will see because fundamentally it is changing and altering the entire entire retail landscape as such. So let me move on to the last slide, which I, and um, please, I mean, the idea here is not to scare everyone, but it's to sort of really notify and sort of say this is happening. It's important that all of you really take cognizance of this. Timu spent, and this is a Wall Street Journal article dated March 7th, an estimated $2 billion with a B on Meta ads in 2023, $2 billion, right? How many companies in the e-commerce space have a revenue of $2 billion in the US? So they are just sort of throwing in the money, the same, maybe a similar amount for Google Ads. They have not really disclosed the budget or estimated the budget. No wonder if your cost per click on Google advertising and Facebook advertising is going up, you know as to why it is going up, right? It is like pay, a huge, big payoff time, a big time for Meta and Google, right? Because they are making money. They are more than happy to get that $2 billion, sort of almost like a money which was non-existent about a year, year and a half back. But this is really driving up the overall CPCs by our estimate in certain categories by up to about 70%. So let me pause there. Some of the categories, the CPC inflation that we have seen year on year, which is Jan 2023 versus Jan 2024, 70%, 70 percent. Wow. So those are the things. So fundamentally, if you now think of it purely, so you're really talking about demand and supply at the end of it, right? So on the demand side, there is a tremendous amount of low cost products which are coming in. You are altering the customer's fundamental behavior and really making every customer a bargain hunter. On the other side, you are creating demand by just aggressive push towards advertising. Anyone where anyone is buying anything just be visible, right? Mm -hmm. And the best channels that you have effectively is Google and Meta because they sort of give you a tremendous amount of reach in this thing. Again, I really sort of wanted to repeat, right? These are the implications. This is how you really have to, as an e-commerce company or a marketer, have to really think of it. All of these are disparate moving parts. and But we are seeing very clearly at Netflix because we are extremely focused on the research of all of these moving parts as to how all of these are coming together. And they are fundamentally creating a very different e-commerce landscape than what we are used to uh, typically. Do you know what the uh, average transit time is for a Timu order to arrive to your home? I wouldn't know that. So that has not been reported in the report as well. So I I'm just curious because we've been told for so long, like the customer wants fast delivery, fast delivery, yeah, but yeah. I'm the assumption that's not going to be as fast as Prime and people are okay with that at the right price. And the prices are so low, Tiffany, I would assume because mm -hmm. I we are not really a Timu shopper yeah. at yet. So I, I, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> right. So right there are, today. Yeah, I know. It's just... There is a massive retail e-commerce disruption sort of happening, right? So my first question is, are we really looking at potentially irreversible changes in shopper behavior, right? Is it a one-way, as, as they say, right? It's almost like a, uh, is it a one-way door or is it a two-way door? I think, unfortunately, because discount shopping becomes a norm and it is, unfortunately, a one-way door. And that's, I think, my first 
call to action, a request for all of you. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, three to seven days is what John says. Yep, yeah, for his orders. So typically, I think the discount shopping, once it becomes a norm, how should fundamentally the overall pricing model, business model, everything changes for other companies as well? So we were very surprised. So my daughter is a big fan of Lulu's, right? So essentially, she goes to the Lulu side, and suddenly there is a discounting in the sales section. There they have a separate sales tab, sale tab, where I think the prices that they are offering is just unbelievable for a brand like to Lulu to really offer, right? So again, the, the entire product portfolio mix fundamentally is changing. Now, that's, I think, one of the things that brands have to really contend with. The second one is the middle market squeeze is very specifically filled in categories like fashion, home goods, et cetera. It's sort of reshaping the landscape. I think I've already made enough point on this thing. Mm -hmm. The last one is an interesting one. Uh, one, of the, one of the strategy gurus that I'm a big fan of is called Alex Osterwald. Uh, he teaches in IMD Lausanne, and he talks about that the future, that the competition would be fought between two business models. And we are very clearly seeing Timu, a one business model, and Sheen really, really revolutionizing the space based on its different on-demand business model as such, right? So this is almost like a just-in-time business model at scale. Now, these are the business models which are fundamentally really difficult to compete with, primarily because they are really have been able to build advantages. They are able to scale to that level. If you want to copy them, it has, I mean, history has proven that Business models cannot be copied in most cases. Most people are lousy followers when it comes to business model copying, right? You can compete based on cost. You can compete based on uh, uh, maybe very specific products that you launch, et cetera. But competing on business model is really tough. And that's what I really wanted to sort of call out and highlight as well. So these are the three fundamental shifts which I would really sort of love to present. And that would really have a big ramification on the business. I So I was, I was speaking at, again, a panel in... Etail this year, two weeks back, and they asked me, what, what, what do brands do? So I have just three recommendations, Stephanie, at this point in time. And they are very broad recommendations. And honestly speaking, since we are a digital agency and not a brand, it is easy for me to make the recommendation because I'm not really fighting the battle. I'm not in the trenches like you are on a daily basis. But I think the three things which we have seen successful brands do, first is build a strong brand, right? What is your brand purpose? and really go ahead and strengthen the brand purpose and really sort of communicate and amplify the brand purpose. That's the first part. The second part is you really have to focus on product innovation because the product innovation effectively, unfortunately, I know that you really have to deal with the commoditization pressure of the marketplaces. You really have to be present to be visible. My question is, can there be product innovation which is exclusively available from your properties, your site, your app, whatever it may be. So product innovation, I think, would be big. Now, the product innovation here would be driven by significantly the evolving customer experiences. So to an extent, while Sheen is talking about on-demand business model, I am talking about on-demand customer understanding or customer behavior understanding model, which you are able to convert it into a product innovation literally on the fly. So mm -hmm. think of it almost like a much more realistic, which is in alignment with your customer preferences and so on. And the third component is you can't really, I think it's very difficult, you can, but it's very difficult to compete in the mass market now. Because as if you, I mean, as if Walmart and Amazon were not really enough and Target, suddenly you have the Timu and the Sheen and everything. So I think it's extremely important for you to select the high value customers. And the concept about high value customers is something that we really have built out a solution on that as well, the, the AI solution I was mentioning about, because these high value customers drive a big chunk of your revenue. I mean, 12 to 15% drive 40% of your revenues and probably about 80% of your profits, right? So why not really build the brand very specifically targeting and engaging those customers responsibly? Mm -hmm. So what we are seeing very clearly in the e-commerce space is typically the process of creative distraction, right? Mm -hmm. It is a part of Capitalism, that's what sort of makes, makes capitalism work and move forward. But at the same time, it's extremely important for us to take a pause and really understand as to how this may really impact the business. Because like it or hate it, this is something that we have to deal with. Generative AI is a mega force. All of these new business models are a mega force. And companies like Timu who are spending at probably about a, a, a hundred times or a thousand times more than you, 
uh, and really sort of flooding the market with cheaper products is a reality, right? So, I mean, you really have to adjust and recognize that and really sort of move on to this thing. So that's where I think my last part is, since we specialize in search advertising, I want to sort of do a part as to how we have tried to fight because working with 170 plus companies, we really have to constantly compete with some of these giants who are everywhere. They are, I mean, $2 billion ad spend, you pretty much are on each and every keyword that you can think of. So very clearly, you really have to understand that you really need new rules for the new game. And when you say new game, we are talking about a black box, like the performance maxes and the advantage pluses and so on. So when we really analyze this, you could really control only so much in this black box. You would control the input. Your input is the goals that you want to set up, the audiences you want to target, and that's pretty much it, the account set up initially. And then you really have to measure the output and keep on really doing it on a recursive basis, right? So these were the inputs that we are the only inputs available when it really goes into a black box model. So you can really control the audiences that you really put as audience signals. We obviously have control over the value centric measurement in a privacy safe environment. And please move away from the last click conversion. It does not work any longer. Uh, it has to be, I think, a full funnel attribution sort of a thing, which we really have to focus on. Creative differentiation becomes huge. And last but not the least, a culture of experimentation becomes quite huge as well. And this was the realization which I talked about, 12 to 15% of the customers drive over 40% of the revenues. So what we did was we really built a tool to predictably identify these high value shoppers. And then we are using them as audience signals to find lookalikes Tiffany on Google and Facebook mm -hmm. or Meta. So it is a slowly using the customer that we really believe is our high value customer. Algorithmically, we are able to find it out and predict them. And then using them as an audience signal, whether in performance max, whether in, uh, let us say, lookalike audiences, uh, or affinity, building those affinity audiences around that, we are able to sort of just build that constantly. And that's where our product, Elixir Insights, it, it uses your data. So basically helps you build your own walled garden. Uh, it has advanced product analytics. So you are able to see as to what are these high value customers buying. And if someone is buying X, what is their propensity of buying Y? So you are able to build those product bundles more effectively. And it really allows you to really do rapid experimentation as well. So think of it almost like a rapid experimentation platform, which uses this data uh, on an ongoing basis. So what our aspiration as a company and a mission as a company is to break the black box. We are doing it by building our own brain, which is the, uh, the, the, the machine learning models that we really have built at the Product Innovation Lab. And we are combining this effectively with this LXR experiments effectively, which is really helping us really run those experiments. Experiments can be improve revenue potential for high value markets, high, high potential markets, improve the frequency of purchase for customers at risk. We are able to predict which of your customers is likely to churn with about a 92% accuracy and so on. And uh, we have seen significant gains, about 5% uh, incremental revenue without really increment, increasing your ad spend is what we have been able to drive through a process of this experimentation within just about four months. So that's what I had effectively in terms of presentation. I think I have I had just one final question and this I'll try to just put it just to make, make a point as well. Maybe we can run a poll again, Tiffany. All right, let's uh, do it. The future of digital marketing is AI plus what? A few seconds here. Coming in. And again, all of you who sort of give the right answer essentially will be sending out those uh, ten dollars Starbucks gift cards. Yeah. You still thinking? All right, I think. Oh. Ten seconds. All right. And then the poll. 52% said experimentation. Absolutely right. That's what it is. So all nice. of you sort of basically sure. get the Starbucks gift card. So that's what I would sort of want to end with. Uh, please, if there was one key takeaway from this thing, the future of performance marketing is AI and rapid experimentations. Uh, so that's what I would sort of want to leave with anyone who is interested, probably in a demo, you can request your demo. Uh, you'll be contacted by our uh, 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 my business development manager, Chris uh, Huacon. And but you can really re request your demo by scanning the QR code using that link, and uh, it will be a pleasure to, for us to understand as to 
how exactly can you help you compete in this intensely competitive world of retail and direct to consumer e-commerce? Thank you very much. Let us love to continue the conversation. Uh, this is my email address. Feel free to email me any point in time. I'm extremely passionate and partnering with BWG Group, we'll be sort of bringing these quarterly quarterly webinars to educate and update you on the latest and the greatest in e-commerce uh, AI marketing. Yeah, thank you. I mean, Dan, you never disappoint. You always bring awesome intel and it's always that like, oh my gosh moment. Like, wow, the things I've learned today, most fascinating facts Thanks. of the week, in my opinion. So definitely um, reach out to the Net Elixir team. They are awesome. Scan that QR code and we'd love to have a conversation with you. You can always reach out to the BWG team. You can reach out to me directly at Tiffany at BWGConnect.com and we can get time on the calendar because that is how we figure out what you guys want to learn about. So definitely feel free to reach out. So with that, it is a wrap. We'll make sure that those gift cards are sent out to the winners. And thank you so much, Dan. Until next time. Thank, thank you, you very much. Take care. Safe travels. Take Thanks care. a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.